Okay, I can see there are more than 60 guests are logged in. So how about we start? I can introduce the event and uh, more people can people can come in. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and a good morning to many of you, uh, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for coming to today's event uh, for the series Environment in Asia at uh, Felbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. My name is Lin Zhang, Zhang Lin in Chinese way. I'm associate professor at Boston College. Um, I'm an environmental historian for uh, Thomson Period China. Um, as a research associate at Felbank Center, I convened the research series called Environment in Asia. For many colleagues and, and friends, um, I want to thank you for um, supporting the series for uh, in the past many years. And uh, I encourage you to continue um, working, supporting, and following us. If you would like to um, reach out and check out our future events, you are encouraged to check out uh, Felbank Center for Chinese Studies um, at the events section. You can Google that. Um, also, I know. Felbank Center now publishing many of its public uh, the past events in recorded forms in the YouTube channel. So you can actually go to YouTube and uh, look for uh, our previous events. So. Um, our next event, I want to emphasize this. If you are interested, please do mark your calendar for November 5th. We are inviting Professor uh, Ying Jia Tan from Wesleyan University, who's gonna come to talk about his new book about energy history of modern China with a focus on electricity. That will be very interesting. So November 5th, Friday, please pay attention to that, mark it down. I would like like to see many of you coming back for that event. All right, uh, without further ado, let me turn to today's event. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our um, wonderful friends, friend, friend of the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies for many years who's been supporting our program um, and personal friend and a colleague, Ruth Mostyn. Professor Ruth Mostyn is a associate professor at University of Pittsburgh, and also uh, there she's also the director for the World History Center. Um, professor Ruth Mostyn is a specialist in spatial and environmental history uh, with a focus on imperial China and the world. She is also a interdisciplinary scholar with research interests bridging the humanities, social sciences, information science, and environmental mental science. So Professor M R Ruth Marston, um, uh, she she, she has many diverse interests and working on many different projects. And uh, she is the author of uh, two monographs. One is called Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern the Spatial and uh, Spatial Organization of the Song State, which was uh, published by Harvard Asian Center in 2011. And her new monograph, The Yellow River, A Natural and Unnatural History, uh, was recently published by the Yale University um, I think just last month or two months ago, right? So she's here to talk about this new book with us. Um, alongside with these two monographs, she's writing multiple articles. She uh, co-authors and co-edited multiple, uh, I think it's multiple, <laughs> edited volume with a focus on spatial history, digital humanity, and also with a focus on gazetteers. So I notice on... Um, uh, from her online profile, uh, Professor Ruth Marston currently um, is a, doing a collaborative um, project funded by the National Endowment of Humanities in order to create a world historical gaz uh, gazetteer that includes content and infrastructure of a spatial linked open data. So this is very exciting. So for today's talk, we will first hear Professor Ruth Marston to talk about her new book, and I would like to have a short conversation with her to ask her to introduce her other projects. And after that, our audience, you're welcome to use the Q&A function on the Zoom to um, send your comments, to share your comments, and to put in your inquiries. So um, I just want to remind you, we have also many audience currently are on YouTube watching the online stream. 
streaming the, of the event. But those of you who are on YouTube, unfortunately, you cannot send in your questions. So, um, uh, so we, if you have a friend, you have colleagues, if you really have inquiry and comments, if you are on YouTube, you can ask your friends to send in your comments on your behalf. Anyhow, this is a wonderful occasion to celebrate Ruth Marston's second new book, beautiful book. Uh, I'm going to turn to you, Ruth, now. Um, well, thank you so much, Ling, for that kind introduction. And um, let me share my screen. Um, OK. So um, I, I am um, grateful in general for, um, of course, for Ling's kind introduction and also especially honored to be part of this series um, that she invited me to because um, she's really one of the first people who I ever talked seriously with about uh, with the Yellow River and um, one of the small number of people with really without whom my new book would not exist. So I'm so delighted to be uh, part of this series that she's organizing and to be in conversation with her. So um, I wanna start with a little bit of a um, kind of um, sort of uh, intellectual autobiography of the new book. And um, Ling mentioned my first book, Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern the Spatial Organization of the Song State, which came out about 10 years ago and came out exactly 10 years ago. And Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern looked at the sort of um, Song political economy from in order to understand why it was that local government units, prefectures and counties were established or disestablished in different parts of the Song realm. And, um, identified the fact that these changes did not happen. Um, it, they happened over time and space in ways that had sort of particular punctuated rhythms. That is, they didn't happen sort of randomly or gradually. They happened in certain times and certain places for certain regions. And soon after I published that book, I came to realize that I had missed a big piece of the environmental story. Both I had missed the fact that on the frontier between the Song regime and the Xi Xia regime, um, that the activities of founding new counties, new prefectures, new fortifications was causing a tremendous amount of erosion. And also that downstream um, on the Yellow River floodplain, this was a time, the Northern Song was a time of a tremendous and tumultuous, and ultimately I came to understand newly severe amount of flooding as well as several major course changes. And I realized that at the margins of my first book, Dividing the Realm, there was information about the significance of those course changes and those floods to the process of establishing and disestablishing local government units, but I didn't really understand that story. So that's the sort of the first piece of the kind of the genesis of my new book. The second piece was that as I started trying to understand what was happening in Yellow River history, I um, kept seeing this kind of phrase, this sort of stock phrase that said there were 1500 floods in Yellow River history. And I'm like, well, that's very specific. I mean, how do we know? Who knows why there are 1500 floods? Um, were there really 1500 floods or is this just literally a sort of a, a kind of a stereotyped stock phrase? And I traced it back. I mean, I didn't do a sort of a full intellectual history and I would really be interested in a 20th century historian talking to me in more detail about this. But basically I figured out that there was a book published in the 1930s called The Yellow River Annals, the Huanghe Nian Biao by Shen Yi um, that seemed to have been the source of this 1500 floods and 30 major course changes um, kind of proposition. And the uh, Huanghe Nian Biao is just a list. I mean, it's literally an annals, right? Year by year, where was there a flood? Where did some activity occur on the Yellow River? When did it happen? And a link back to some primary source. And it's a physical book, it's a written book. This is of course, long before digital systems were developed. But um, I developed the kind of uh, quixotic idea, the crazy idea 
that it would be a good idea that as far as I could tell, people were still kind of saying this sort of 1500 floods and that nobody had really gone back, especially in the context of new digital methods to figure out whether that seemed about right or not. And so I decided to um, start a new project that covered the entirety, all of the thousands of years of Yellow River history in order, much as I had done methodologically in dividing the realm, to start by creating a database and then to see how things were punctuated, how in time and space we could tell the history of the Yellow River as a sequence of events. And that project, which I started almost 10 years ago, has now come to fruition with the publication of my new book. So when I talk about the Yellow River, um, one of the things that I uh, came to the conviction of really early on as I was working on this project was to understand the history of the river, not just as the history of its floodplain, but as the history of the entire watershed. And so what you see here on this slide is exactly that. All of the area that you see colored in various shades of green and brown are is the entirety of the Yellow River watershed, including on the east, the floodplain, which is comprised really of three subplains, the uh, three sub floodplains, um, the Yellow River, the High River, and the Fly River, together constitute this vast floodplain um, that lies on both sides of the Shandong Peninsula. And then upstream, um, the large catchment zone from which all of the tributaries enter the Yellow River, starting on the northern part of the Tibetan Plateau, and centrally, as you can see here, entraining the Les Plateau. Um, and so this is a region of very thick, less soil. And I came to understand, and I'll talk about this more in just a minute, that the history of the Yellow River is significantly tied. It's inextricable from the history of the Les Plateau because all of the sediment that over millions of years constituted the floodplain and that within historical time um, is, is the history within which people and the river are entangled is the story of what happens to that sediment from the Les Plateau through which, as you can see on this map, the Yellow River makes its characteristic great bend um, north, east, and then south again, basically um, circumnavigating the central part of the Les Plateau. Within the Les Plateau, within its floodplain and within this large sort of continental region that takes up most of North China, the Yellow River over time has occupied many, many different courses, which you can see here as a variety of colored lines. Another way of putting this is that the Yellow River, like many rivers, is not best understood as a line that travels neatly through a course, but rather as an entire zone. The floodplain of the Yellow River is very flat indeed. Um, historically, or I should say perhaps prehistorically, much of this region was constituted by wetlands, shallow courses, um, which would um, easily fill with sediment and the river would then meander among one or multiple of its many courses to the sea. It's only during historical times, and as we'll see in a minute, pretty late during historical times, that it became interesting for people to lock the river into a single course. The river on its own would be occupying multiple of these historical courses simultaneously and changing course among them as sediment accumulates. So as I said, the history of the Yellow River, the way that I have pursued it in this book is really significantly a history of this accumulating less sediment. And the key thing to know about the less sediment um, as this uh, quote on the corner of my slide here indicates is that less is very resistant to erosion under vegetation cover, but readily erodible without it. And so as you can see in this sort of, um, kind of um, microscopic photograph of the composition of the soil on the upper right-hand part of my slide, one of the things that's significant about less soil is that it is comprised of grains of a variety of shapes. And within those kind of tiny particles of soil, 
therefore are voids between the soil. And that means that as long as there is ground cover, grasses, trees, et cetera, covering over the soil, um, it's really permeable to water. It's great. It has fantastic drainage. That's one of the reasons why um, people practicing early agriculture, Neolithic people, found this such easy land to work. That also means that as soon as the ground cover is destroyed, the soil can very quickly um, become powdery and blow away. And, um, and that's what these four, I call these my less selfies. These are um, taken near, near Zhengzhou. And um, that with just a tiny bit of manipulation, first of all, it can form very easily into, um, into hard clumps. It's an almost concrete level, hard um, material that was used for buildings, but also that unless it's sort of pounded into shape, sort of locking in those interstitial voids between the particles, it also just easily becomes dust. It's very fine. It blows away. It makes its way into the watershed where it can, within which gravel and even boulders can become suspended, like a sort of a slurry, a kind of a mudslide under um, conditions of heavy water. And so that's the sort of the story of the um, environmental context and the ecological context within which the story of the Yellow River that I tell transpires. So um, um, one of the other things that's important to note is that the uh, history, at the history of the rate at which sediment from the Les Plateau accumulates in the river has changed dramatically over time. And um, this is a graph, this is um, this basically runs from a, from the point of view of a historian runs from um, from right to left, showing the amount of sediment accumulation. And this is um, from soil cores in various places in the river, in tributaries, in lake beds, and um, and in, uh, in the ocean, the coastal ocean, that um, 12,000 years ago, the amount of sediment that accumulated was about 0 0.2 centimeters per year. Rose uh, a little bit at the Holocene climatic optimum, which was a time of greater rainfall, but also therefore a time of greater vegetation growth and the era during which uh, farming began on the Les Plateau. Rose again significantly uh, during the Neolithic and Bronze Age. So by the end of the Bronze Age, basically the rate had tripled over its um, pre-anthropogenic rates, but was still quite low at that point before rising dramatically during the 2000, say 25 hundred year pre-imperial and imperial eras, essentially of um, increasingly efficient iron technology and increasingly dense populations and increasingly um, ambitious governments um, to a rate ultimately of approximately 1.6 centimeters per year of sediment deposition. Always also with years of low rainfall representing times of less sediment deposition. So this is um, a one way of telling the whole history, the whole story of the Yellow River is through the history of its soil, as we can see from the work of soil scientists, right? Not historians working with historical sources, um, not even archaeologists working at their time frames, but the history of the soil itself as it has settled on other places within the floodplain. So what happened there? Um, so again, one of the ways that this links back to my first book, one of the stories of my first book, Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern, is about the fortification of the Song Xixia border, um, a, during which ultimately I discovered, well, during in my first book, focusing on the Northern Song and looking at this dramatic expansion in the number of settlements between the middle of the 8th century, which you can see there in figure A, the middle of the 11th century in figure B, and the early 12th century in figure C. And so each of these, if you remember back to that first map of the Les Plateau, I've actually, um, I've included a version of one of those maps here. And, um, and 
all of those settlements, all of those new frontier settlements, essentially were running across the northern edge of the Ordos region, a sort of ecotone between um, semi-arid grasslands and desert. And that was the region that was contended between the Song and the Shishia people, and also therefore was the region of dense fortification. And um, ultimately, um, right, and even at the time, people were starting to comment on the deforestation they were causing, the erosion that they were seeing. This was visible during historical times, during the Northern Song, and ultimately um, transformed places that had been sort of grassland plateaus into dissected and heavily eroded territories like the ones that you see here up in the upper left. This is um, an area just south of the Wuding River um, in what had been this intensive settlement zone. Um, right, and there again, um, that's uh, that star represents approximately the location of the image that you see there, that grasslands image. And um, a contemporary image just to sort of highlight the fact that once this erosion occurred on the Les Plateau, once the Yellow River became the sediment laden body of water that it transformed into over time, and I'll show some timelines of that in just a second, that the problem of sediment becomes a problem that the floodplain, that the people of the floodplain and the regimes that controlled the floodplain had to manage as they do um, down to the present day, as you can see in, uh, in this image. So um, this is a map then of all of the floods that occurred, that were tested to have occurred, I should say. I'm now, as, we, as I'm sort of talking through questions of evidence, pivoting here towards uh, the historical evidence that also constitutes an important part of my project. So from soil cores, now into historical information accumulated together to become data sort of in the spirit of this uh, Huanca Nienbia, this annal of the Yellow River. And you can see the floods fanning out across the whole floodplain as they, um, as, as the floodplain itself, as the river itself occupies its many historical courses. Um, with some of these, um, again, this is a, a, an archeological site, um, an excavation uh, that is happening right now uh, around the location, at the location of the Kaifeng city wall and showing, documenting this dramatic rate of sediment accumulation over time. And including, you can even see there right in the middle of that image, a sort of a slack water lake that formed um, at some point during one of the Qing dynasty floods that pooled together in this um, many meters thick accumulation of Yellow River sediment. Um, and then showing just kind of zooming in here on um, all of the floods um, as they moved through the many courses of the river and entrained the city of Kaifeng at various times in history. So, um, now sort of moving out to the sort of macro scale of what can we tell through a story of the data about all these floods. So one thing that we can see and what you see here is two pieces of information. One, the dotted line, the continuous dotted line is the moisture variance mean. So this is um, how the amount of rainfall essentially has changed year by year. And then um, the white lines, the bars, are the floods that are attested around Kaifeng in historical sources. And so one of the things that you can see is that there is a very long era, essentially from earliest times, and this goes back only to the fifth century. I have data as far back as people were writing about this, back to the warring states, a very long period that basically goes until the middle of the 10th century when very, very few floods were tested. A second period um, roughly coinciding with the Northern Song with that era of rapidly intensifying occupation on the Les Plateau, a punctuation of flooding, um, very little attestation of floods during the Jin, but that doesn't mean that they weren't happening. That's, a, that's something we might wanna talk about in Q&A. The Jin just simply did not keep track of flooding, even though that was actually a very tumultuous time in river history, anomalously 
um, very intensive flooding during the Yuan and Ming, and then less flooding during the Qing. And that's one of the things I'll be focusing on in a minute, because of course we think of the Qing correctly as a time of intensive scrutiny and intensive management of the Yellow River. But what this means actually is that it was a time of relatively successful flood control up until it wasn't anymore, basically. Um, so this is essentially, I think, um, in the in the interest of time, I'm going to pass over this relatively quickly. This is the entire set of event data that I have in my database going back from Warring States time to the end of the imperial era, again, attesting the fact that it wasn't until the turn of the 10th century that there began to be a significant rate of disaster. And also, um, so that's one of the pieces of information here. Another is that um, the disasters that, were, that I have coded in my database as breaches of levees right, also only became a higher ratio of all the disasters over time. And basically that's a sort of roundabout way of saying that high water and course changes and sediment deposition only becomes something that counts to people as being a disaster at the point that they are engaging in civil engineering around it, they're engaging in activity, they are building levees in order to support the existence of dense populations and cities and agriculture. And that's one of the other things, sort of without going into all the details that you can see here in these images. Um, and then, um, and so that's all on the sort of the top image here. The bottom image then is about um, all, is about the percentage of events of management, events of engineering on the floodplain that were depicted as repairs rather than other kinds of waterworks management. And so again, sort of focusing in on this idea that essentially once people start building massive amounts of waterworks engineering, it creates a new kind of regime of culture, of spending, and of relationships to the river. Um, and this is just again, focusing on that sort of um, late ninth century, um, early 10th century moment where there was this pivot in people's relationship to the river and in the amount of flooding that was being reported. And then um, here, this sort of era, this Tai Ching era of successful water management. So um, another way we can look at this is um, that this, right, so what I wanna focus on now briefly is what happened during that high Qing era of successful water management. So basically until the 17th century, until, well, well basically until the Ming Qing transition, the, um, the rate at which river disasters were tested in historical sources and the rate at which events of water engineering were tested tracked very closely to one another. And that's what you can see here, basically in this white line and this black line on the table I'm showing you. Then um, around, right around the founding of the Qing, you can see that that switches place. The number of events of management increased dramatically. The number of events of disaster decreased dramatically, reaching an extraordinary peak at the beginning of the, of the 19th century before then um, switching place once again. And so this is one way of doing long-term history, I think. I'm talking about the Yellow River here, but I'm also talking about a sort of historical methodology more generally, that we can tell a story of the relationship between people and the river by tracking these interesting moments when this ratio of problems that people saw and of solutions that they were implementing changed in various directions at the very long term. Um, this is also a way right, of, of being able to say, we can literally pinpoint using information like this, when it was that the Yellow River started to seem like a peril and a problem. And, um, and also thinking maybe historiographically about the fact that 
um, I think it's often the case that both in Anglophone literature and in Sinophone literature, that the Yellow River is kind of portrayed or seen as, a, as, as having been an intractable problem since time immemorial, as it were. And I think that's really looking back in time as something that didn't really begin to be the case until well into the 19th century. And that's another thing that I think is visible from this kind of long-term and data analytical work. Um, I think I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I wanna make sure that we have time for Q&A and discussion. Um, so what was it that was happening during the Qing dynasty? Why did this very lengthy idea of sort of letting the river kind of um, subsist with a certain amount of disastrousness in this sort of post 10th century environment, right? What changed um, gradually during the Ming and then very rapidly during the Qing? And the answer is basically the Grand Canal that the yellow, the course of the Yellow River transects the Grand Canal near Holmes the Lake uh, for reasons of geopolitics, reasons of transportation and political economy. It ended up um, seeming to the regime like it was absolutely essential, like all Yellow River management had to be oriented toward ensuring that the Grand Canal was always passable. And so what you see here in this set of six maps is the um, sort of history of geocoded events of both disaster and management around Holmes Lake, the course, the historical course of the river, which was throughout the this era from the 13th to the 19th century, was always north of Holmes Lake, um, and a series of events starting with the founding of the Ming and ending with the change of course of the Yellow River um, in the mid 19th century. This intensive um, ultimately this intensive management of the river. The dark gray events are events of management. The white circles are events of disaster. And what you can see here essentially is a transition first to more and more disaster and ultimately towards this high Qing, this 17th, this sort of long 18th century period of intensive management of the region around Holmes Lake on the Yellow River. Um, which also can look like this. Um, and this is not something that's in my database. This is something that comes from maps that other people have created, basically taking what used to be a very, what had at one time in the sort of the early Ming, the, the Yuan had been a very simple kind of intersection between the Grand Canal and the Yellow River ultimately became this intensively engineered location um, that, um, and yeah, well, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. I have another image I'll show that's related to this in a minute, right? And then here, just kind of zeroing in again on this moment I was talking about this, um, this is just really the same data I was talking about, but here looking at that kind of dramatic and really um, historically anomalous. There is just this one period, this one period of really just the greater 18th century and the long 2000 year plus history of recorded Yellow River history. There is only this one century when the amount of intensive human activity, intensive engineering on the river was adequate to just drive down the rate of disasters and was actually successful. Um, and that's another point is that it actually, one of the things that this history tells is the fact that it actually is possible by devoting enough engineering and enough money to depress the rate of disasters, thus keeping the Grand Canal open and passable for a really long time. I mean, for that one long century when it became essential for that to be the case. Um, we talked about this before. And um, this then is just another, this is a 19th, 19th, maybe 18th century map of that confluence between the Grand Canal, the Yellow River, the Huai River, and Holmes Lake. And um, this is basically, this is one of the maps from which the diagram I showed you earlier was taken. And the point I wanna make here, right, um, what I've really been stressing throughout this talk is the idea that floods, right from this 1942 American engineer, that floods are so-called quote unquote acts of God, but flood losses are largely acts of man. It's only once a highly engineered system like this occurs, 
once a right once the entire sort of political and economic structure of the empire depends on ensuring that floods don't shut down the Grand Canal, that disasters become disastrous, and that spending activities have to focus on making sure that floods don't occur in a disastrous way. Um, and so again, the intensive management began in the 18th century, ended in the middle of the 19th century. And one last thing I want to focus on here with this slide is also the idea of sacrifice zones. And so you can see here this image I took um, traveling around Holmesa Lake. This is sort of the southwestern corner of Holmesa Lake, um, traveling around the lake and seeing this same sort of um, um, barrier, this stone wall that you can also see represented in the map, which is where high water was supposed to disgorge onto wetlands, ultimately onto people's homes and fields away from the canal rather than into the canal itself. It's not that the amount of sediment flowing into the river changed. It's not that the amount of water that was coursing through the Yellow River system changed when water was high. It was an explicit decision about where to direct that sediment, where to direct that water, and the explicit and intentional creation of certain places as sacrifice zones. So I'm just about done here. I just wanted, I know I've been making a lot of um, propositions and assertions that are based on data and that are methodological. Um, this is something that I don't wanna spend too much time on now, but I would be happy to talk about in the Q&A. Um, my upper course, my less plateau data um, is basically um, sort of geocoded and restructured based on the historical atlas of China and the China historical GIS and the um, lower course information from publications like the Yellow River Annals. Um, in fact, after all of that, I started out my talk saying that um, Shen Yi um, had a, um, proposed that there were 1,500 floods on the Yellow River, floods and 30 course changes. Indeed, that is almost exactly what I came up with. So um, that was a lot of work to uh, reaffirm what uh, what what he uh, what he discovered, although I've sort of split and merged data, I can talk more about that. And a total of 3,754 events in my event database um, that I can then query and create um, um, assertions and um, timelines and maps like the ones that you've seen here. So this is um, again, as as Ling mentioned, this is um, a talk that's based on my newly published book. Here's the information about that book. And um, I want to really make sure, and this is something also I'd be um, honored, delighted to talk about in Q&A, this was a really, really, really collaborative project. I had so many collaborators and students over the years who helped me with this um, data work, who um, helped me with database design, database queries, cartography, and um, I really want to make so sure to honor and acknowledge all of those individuals. So I will um, leave it at that. I'll have a conversation with Ling and then we'll take it from there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. This is a fantastic uh, introduction to your book. And I want to emphasize this issue uh, at this point. This is a not only a very rich, informative, insightful book, but it's a beautiful book. I have a copy at home since I'm traveling, so I don't have the physical book with me, well, but I read it. It's a so beautiful, it's such a, ple a pleasure to, to hold it in hand. So I, I highly encourage everybody to get, um, get a copy. You, know, you can ask your library to acquire uh, a copy from Yale University Press. Um, it's, it's a wonderful publication. The artwork is fantastic. So I just want to quickly, before we turn to Q&A, so here, I uh, encourage our participants, our audience to send in your comments, your inquiry, um, anything you can think of uh, through the Q&A function on the Zoom, um, because uh, you cannot really uh, see others' questions and comments. So at the end, I will collate all your comments and a question. I will read them out one by one, and hopefully we have en enough time to cover all of them. But before we move there, I would like to quickly mention this. So um, Ruth, um, um, 
congratulations on publishing this beautiful book. But as I'm looking back a few years um, uh, uh, back then, uh, back the time when we were talking about your project and we were talking about my project, and I would like to to say how amazing actually the past few years was such a golden time for Yellow River Studies. Right, we have your book, and uh, if we look back to uh, 2014, we have a Professor Micah Muscolino's book, The Ecological War in China, which was published by Cambridge University Press. Um, and then I think a year later, we have a wonderful book, The Yellow River, uh, written by Professor David Pierce from the University of Arizona. Um, and then two years, uh, no, another year later, 2016, I published my book also on Yellow River, which was from Cambridge University Press. So now we have all these amazing collection of Yellow River studies together in English available for the, our readers, our audience. Sometimes I jokingly tell my friends and colleagues, I half jokingly and half seriously, we can literally um, uh, design syllabus and uh, teach undergrad level and uh, graduate level courses based on this vast body, let's say, of Yellow River scholarship. But let me put it in this way, every book has its own unique emphasis, a different strength and uh, unique constraints. And uh, for instance, if I talk about my own book, it focuses on a certain relatively short amount of a time um, during the Song period. And also in terms of spatial coverage, it only focuses on the lower reaches, the flood, the floodplain of the Yellow River. Micah's book uh, focuses on 21st, uh, 20th century Republican era. David's book covers a vast period of time, but the focus was really about a modern China. And each of us have a thematical methodological differences. And your book is very ambitious. It covers a thousands of years of the period of time. And you also made uh, made a strong case that you are looking at a yellow river for the entire watershed, not just a segment, a geographical segment of the watershed. So um, this kind of approach, this kind of ambition, you did so well to demonstrate in the book. It gave you this opportunity, but I believe also introduced a lot of the problems and the challenges during this time that you conducted research. So I think this will be a wonderful opportunity. Actually, you can talk to all of us, especially I noticed many graduate students in the, are actually here in audience. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what, are all, uh, what kind of challenges that you faced, you dealt with, how you dealt, how you dealt with them? And especially you uniquely use spatial analysis, use digital tools, right? use a spatial a geographical information system to cope with many of the challenges. Can you say something about that, um, including especially your own approaches, your ways of coping with challenges? Yeah, sure. You know, one of the things that um, is sort of a nagging problem with doing this kind of multidisciplinary work that includes data analysis, readings of environmental science and archaeological literature, and also, though I didn't talk about it too much in this presentation, of course, also the core historian's craft of reading and interpreting written documents. And moving back and forth between those scales and between those types of analysis is always difficult. And the thing that I started out this book wanting to prove prove, maybe I'll sort of put in quotes, was that the um, sedimentation, the erosion on the upper course of the river caused the flooding on the floodplain, right? And that there would be this sort of, you know, neat and linear kind of trail of causation that started with human settlement and exploitation of the Les Plateau, led from there to rising rates of erosion, led from there to rising rates of flooding, and led from there to a higher rate, higher rates of disaster. But of course, um, things are messier than that. Once you zoom out to a 3000 year time frame, causation kind of drops away and all you have is correlation, right? And so um, I 
I can see when it was that the population and exploitation of the Les Plateau increased. I can see when it was that uh, erosion increased. And I can see when it was that people started writing more about the floodplain. But I can't quite see, it's just not quite visible in the big data sets um, that any of those things actually caused the other as opposed to just kind of correlating together in time. And so one of the things that I was really looking hard for in the written sources was people at the time who said, okay, we can see that there's more erosion or, okay, we understand that the reason why the Yellow River has become more prone to floods is because of something that's happening hundreds of miles away. And I found that occasionally, but I didn't really, you know, and whenever I found those instances, I tried to really just sort of latch onto them and use them as well as I could. But of course, People don't write with historians, future historians, a thousand years later in mind. They write with their interests in mind. And um, they weren't particularly interested in making these connections. And part of it is because of, you know, something that um, ecologists refer to as shifting baseline theory, right? The idea that within a human lifespan, within maybe even less than a human lifespan, whatever people are experiencing seems normal to them at the time, right? We have this in the contemporary world as we experience climate change, pollution, et cetera, right? Um, species extinctions and et cetera, whatever we experience is our normal. And that was certainly true for people in the historical past as well. Um, and then also just because, you know, on the instances sort of now and again through the hundreds of years, um, through the millennia, when people said, you know, when historical actors said, you know, I think the reason why there's so much um, sediment in the Yellow River on the floodplain is because of erosion that's happening further upstream. People did say that periodically, but it was not really within the realm of political possibility for anyone to act on that information. Um, it's not like you could like people could just change a policy regime altogether. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, of course, I face challenges of working with data. <clears throat> we can certainly talk about that. But. Excuse me, but also just in terms of thinking about how to tell <clears throat> a convincing historical story that isn't just look at all this stuff I can put in front of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I for one have learned a lot from the methodological approach that you innovated in this book. So um, I don't want to take up too much time. I do have many things I want to talk to you about, but we can um, leave them to our future um, encounters. So there are actually many questions and comments coming in um, through the Q&A. So um, in the next about 48 minutes, we have a no, not 48. We have a 30, about 30, 38 minutes left for this, for this conversation. So we will dedicate all this uh, um, at the rest of the time to the Q&A. So Ruth, I'm just going to go through the list and read them out uh, one by one. And um, um, feel free to, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm just going to read them one by one. So uh, first one we can, we've already answered. Ah, okay, so the first question comes from Catherine Moore from uh, McGill University. Catherine asks, how is the climate change affecting Yellow River and the people's health? So you kind of like answered the first part, but people's health, so. Right, and um, you know, I, I, this is, this is a book, my book ends, kind of ends at 1911. Um, and that's intentional, both because the base of sources changes so much at that point, and because of David Peetz's wonderful book about the 20th century Yellow River, and also because the sort of um, the industrial regime of modernity, sort of heavy industrial ways of managing the river are so different than the historical ways of managing the river. So all of that is to say that I am not really focused on 21st century, 20th and 21st century climate change and river management and health, um, although that's certainly something I'm 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 interested in. Um, 
And of course now, you know, the sort of ironic kind of end of the story as it were of the Yellow River is that now the problem is that so much of it has been redirected for irrigation that the river does not even consistently make its way to the ocean anymore. And so it's a new problem of catastrophic dust storms and water scarcity rather than flooding. Um, but to pivot back to the historical era, one of the things I talked briefly towards the end of my comments about um, the intentional creation of sacrifice zones, right? And the idea that this sort of high Qing long 18th century successful management of floods on the Yellow River, successfully doing so much building of levees and sluice gates and dams and, um, and uh, reservoirs, great drainage canals and so on, that um, that went along with identifying some people, some places, some kinds of activity that would be sacrificed. And one of the things that that meant is that in those locations alongside the levees that developed very poor drainage because the natural tributaries had been extinguished, um, wetlands grew, uh, grew up, they became highly saline, um, 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 parasitical insects moved into those areas, the productivity of agriculture fell dramatically, and the rate at which people acquired waterborne diseases increased. And so, you know, in a sense, I mean, my sort of bird's eye, my big story about the history of the Yellow River is what it looked like, not only for the whole watershed, but therefore from the point of view of the regime, but absolutely on the floodplain, this went along with um, high levels of disease, decreasing agricultural productivity, decreasing access to firewood and, um, and reeds, sort of water growing reeds that were used as building materials, all of which flowed to the state rather than to the individuals who needed them and um, therefore just caused a high level of misery. And it's also, there's also evidence going back at least to the song of the fact that when, um, when people were um, kind of um, forced into corvée labor, that is the labor service that people um, owed as part of their obligations to the state, or when soldiers were forced into river, du river duties. So both through um, soldiers and through um, this uh, corvée labor system, people had to labor on the river. And that was um, horrific work. The rate of uh, death and injury and just overall misery was really, really high. And there are lots of stories about people trying to buy their way out of that service, escape from that service. And so um, the life of people on and around the river was really, really bad as also on the Les Plateau, there's also evidence going all the way back to the Song of, actually going all the way back to the Han. We have information of settlers and soldiers who were sort of forced to move into those frontier locations and um, did their best to escape, right? These were places that were, I mean, the reason they were frontiers is because they were so very marginal for agriculture and yet people were compelled to perform agriculture in these remote and distant places and um, did so under tremendous misery. So, so I really appreciate this question that kind of um, asks us to focus on what this history means at the level of, of individuals and their well-being. Mm -hmm. And I want to add one line. So Catherine, if you are interested in this late chain uh, transformation and impacts on human lives that Ruth just uh, um, um, talked about, you may also like to check out Kenneth Pomeran's book, The Making of Hinderland, in which he talks a lot about that. And um, you, you may like also to check out, check out a Chinese book written by Professor Ma Junya uh, at an Anjing University. It's called the Bei Xi Shen de Ju Bu, the sector of the empire which was sacrificed. So he talks a lot about the human suffering and the health issue there. Okay, let's move on to the next question. <laughs> so there are a lot of questions come, comes in actually. So um, 
very quickly, actually, Ruth, would you like to share the slide with your book? Again, somebody would like uh, Lock, uh, Lockwood Young mentioned. And so, yeah, I think sure. many of us yeah, would Sure, yeah, let like me just share, um, share screen again for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, here we are. Me... And actually, uh, as you are doing that, I'm going to read out very quickly S uh, Steve Harrow's uh, question because he said he's leaving at 5 p.m. That means we have two minutes to talk. If uh, okay, here. and um, can you all see this? Is this the slide you're looking for? I, I believe that's it. Okay, So uh, uh, Steve says, Ruth, this is wonderful. Looking forward to reading the book. Very quick question, and, and I'm not sure if Steve is still here. One reads distressed quotations from Qing officials about population pr uh, pressure and the result that people were actually forming and living within the outer dikes. How did this relate to concerns about the canal? Uh, was it a factor in their management decisions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question. I, I really that's something I really have have spent time thinking about. So just as a sort of a, a kind of a background on this topic. So during this, well, off and on starting in the late 15th century. So starting in the Ming, um, the one of the ways to manage the floodplain around the Grand Canal was to build two sets of dikes. There was an inner set of dikes that straightened the river's course and narrowed it, right? And you can sort of understand the physics of this. You take all of the water, you squeeze it in and you narrow it, right? And that causes the current to speed up dramatically, right? The river can no longer meander. It can no longer move even a little bit around the floodplain. And so it zooms past the canal. And so there was double diking around the canal. And I, I could show you this on that um, Holmes Lake map that I, that I had in, my, in, in, in one of my slides, a couple of my slides. But basically this inner dike that was intended basically to serve the purpose of scouring out the silt from the river pushing it downstream past the canal. Um, and, um, and I'll say that that created one kind of sacrifice zone because it's not like the sediment that was pushed past the Grand Canal ceased to exist anymore. It just means that it wasn't in the canal itself. And so what that did in sort of the first, the kind of initial um, kind of experiments with this method, which were um, performed by a Ming official named Pan Jixun, was to radically and rapidly increase the um, rate of sediment accumulation on the delta to create just sort of this vast mud flat at the mouth of the Yellow River. And ultimately that caused the water to sort of backwash back up the river again. The engineering had to be modified, but basically in a way it was more or less successful. It did in fact, this sort of narrow diking did in fact push the sediment past the confluence between the Yellow River and the Grand Canal, but at the expense of basically turning every place downstream the canal um, into you know, one of these sort of sacrifice zone territories, this area that became so inundated with sediment and salty water, brackish water, that it became impossible to farm. So that's the narrow diking. But um, the purpose of those narrow dikes wasn't flood prevention, it was changing the river current. And so then some kilometers away, like maybe five or so kilometers away from the inner dikes was another set of outer dikes. And that was the area within which the sort of the implicit promise, the social contract of the state was that this is where we will try to prevent flooding from happening. And people were forbidden from living and farming between the inner dikes and the outer dikes. But of course they did. Of course they did. Right. There was land scarcity. Um, and so people. Right. And of course, it was often very fertile between the inner dikes and the outer dikes, although it became brackish over time. Um, and so people moved into the region between the outer dikes and the inner dikes and um, always with. Um, you know, just kind of, um, I guess all I'll, I'll say, I mean, other than the fact that this happened, the state never, never succeeded in preventing it. I don't think they really tried that hard to prevent it, honestly. 
um, right? But it's um, just an interesting kind of push and pull of land use and agency, right? And something I think about often, I mean, in the contemporary world with, right, questions of flood risk, disaster risk, and the real um, kind of... Um, sort of ambiguity and kind of kind of mixed feelings that you know governments and in the contemporary world insurance agencies have to risk taking right on the one hand it's not that the people moving into these sort of you know forbidden but tantalizing lands between the inner and outer dikes didn't know what risks they were taking of course they did but the hope is that this year's flood or this decade's flood or the flood that's going to wipe out everyone for dozens of miles along some stretch of this land isn't going to happen, you know, to me or in my lifetime or in my family, right? And it somehow becomes a risk that people are willing to take. And I think, you know, for any kind of environmental history project and any kind of disaster history project, thinking of it in terms of these sort of what risks do people find manageable? What kinds of risks are people willing to take is one really useful approach. I think in our COVID era, we can all feel that, right? Anytime we decide, you know, how big a crowd are we willing to go out into? You know, are we willing, you know, do we feel like we need to wear a mask in this situation or that situation, right? We're making judgments about risk as the people who did, who lived between those inner and outer dikes and then hoped for the best. Great answer, Ruth. Um, I really hate to do this to you, Ruth, but I'm going to ask you to keep your answers concise because I want you to go through all these questions. We have many questions comes in and they're really great. So, so let's try to cover all of them. So next question is from Prasanjit Dwara from Univer uh, Duke University. So uh, Prasanjit asks, question one, is there a role of early climate change? Question two, so you choose <laughs> if we have time. Question two, uh, Pierre Etienne Will suggests that there are three phases, including phase two of a heavy infrastructure that leads to more powder levees, et cetera, which leads to phase three of an inundation. So does engineering produce new consequences and problems? Sure. Um, let me let me first take the uh, the question about climate change, and then maybe I'll I want you to prompt me again about the details of uh, Pierre Dienville's question, mm -hmm. um, if I'm if I'm not remembering them. Mm -hmm. So climate change, right? Um, so one of the data sources that I've been really lucky to be able to work with is the Monsoon Asia Drought Atlas, which goes back to about the sixth century, and so from that we can see when there are times that are more moist in history, when there are times that are more arid in history. Um, I'll say it again, um, since uh, Ling has asked me to keep it brief, what I will say is that um, rainfall, the amount of rainfall that occurred in any given year seems not to have had a direct relationship to the amount of flooding that occurred in that year, since also the engineering that was occurring um, had so much to do, right, just luck and engineering essentially had so much to do with any individual instance of when and where a flood happened. The place where climate makes a huge difference is actually on the Les Plateau, where the um, the uh, amount, the moisture gradient of the Les Plateau from um, the sort of the southern part around the Chinling Mountains up to the northern part around the Gobi Desert, um, pretty much you know every kilometer also made a difference in less and less moisture, and also in the likelihood in any given year that the moisture from the monsoon would reach that location. And so the way that climate change makes a huge difference in the history that I'm telling in this book is the ability to build and sustain um, agrarian settlements or any kind of fortified outpost on the Les Plateau, the ability for farmers to live densely on the Les Plateau, and the likelihood of um, conflict and friction and different kinds of interchange between um, um, pastoralist and agrarianist 
modes of subsistence. So there's a very significant climate change story here and some sort of dramatic moments, especially in the Ming, where climate change made a huge difference, but less for the flooding part of the story and more for the upstream colonization part of the story. Let me um, quickly remind you of the second question. Sure. So um, uh, Will's um, uh, uh, thesis on three phases, mm -hmm. hydrological cycle, and the second phase of um, um, building infrastructure would lead to the third phase of inundation. So the question is, uh, does engineering that you talked about produce a new consequences and problems? Right. So, um, yeah, so basically, I want to say there was some engineering that preceded floods, especially if we go sort of all the way back to the Warring States era, back through archaeological evidence, even further into the Neolithic, we can see that people were creating ponds and levees and, you know, ways of sort of separating water and wetlands at very, very early times. Um, and so there's essentially, and I guess I sort of said this in my talk, that you know, uh, uh, high water doesn't count as a disaster until people create situations that cause it to be disastrous. So when you have um, widespread wetlands and no construction, water can rise and fall, the, the river course can change, and it doesn't even necessarily get recorded in the historical sources. And so I think the way, I mean, I can periodize the big history at the large scale of centuries and millennia, and that basically, sort of to keep it brief, there's kind of the pre-10th century low disaster era and the post-10th 10th century high disaster era. But then among the sort of the shorter term cycles, I think the way I would periodize it is first there's construction, then there are rising rates of events attested as being disastrous, then there's more construction, and then ultimately there's some systemic rupture, and then things sort of start over again in some way. Um, and maybe I'll just add one, one short more couple of sentences, which is that one thing I didn't do in my talk for today, but that I talk about in the book, is um, sort of contrasting the Ming and the Qing. The Ming also, of course, was a Grand Canal, was a, was, was a regime that cared about the Grand Canal, but decided not to engage until pretty late in the era in intensive engineering on the Yellow River. And so what that meant is that rather than the canal sort of functioning as kind of, you know, one line that barges could transect from one end to the other, you know, from, from Hangzhou to Beijing, it was basically a series of kind of offloading and onloading onto lakes and wetlands and natural tributaries and small bits of canal. Basically, that's something that goes from the Sui through the Ming was um, a sort of a kind of a coexistence of a, of a nat natural ish, maybe a semi a quasi natural um, kind of um, wetland network with um, these other kinds of transportation imperatives. And so what happened in the Qing was really something quite different from that for the first time. Thank you. All right, uh, let's look at um, another set of questions. So there are two questions coming from Eric Lee, who says, thank you, Professor Marston, for this wonderful presentation. I have two questions. First, I'm curious if the fall of the Yuan Dynasty had contributed in any way to this heightened sense of a consequence uh, of environmental disaster. Okay, the, the role of the Yuan Dynasty, uh, the fall of the Yuan Dynasty. Second, I remember hearing from Benjamin Elman a couple of years ago that there are policy questions on the civil service examination regarding hydraulics in the late imperial era. By any chance, do you see any correlation between the appearance of such questions and intensified hydrological construction during late imperial times? Yeah, um, yeah, let me answer the second question first because that's easy. Um, Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that happened um, really starting in, you know, kind of straight on through the late Ming, there were people who were 
interested in hydraulics, people who wrote books about hydraulic engineering, but there weren't really people whose careers in the civil service were really as river experts. That is absolutely a Qing, a kind of a late Ming, but really a Qing um, kind of career path that people could really orient themselves for the entirety of their career toward the river. So I haven't studied civil service exam questions as part of my project, but it is um, it makes uh, complete sense to me that 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 the Qing is when you would see um, civil service exam questions that focus on hydraulic engineering. That that goes with what I can see in people's career arcs and the idea of being a technical expert on river engineering. Um, in terms of the UN, yes, um, I think actually I would put a causality, I mean, again, briefly simplifying what's in the book, I would briefly put it in the other direction, which is that actually um, kind of um, surprisingly, sort of counterintuitively, the first proposals for a highly engineered Grand Canal interacting with a highly engineered Yellow River actually date from the late Ming, from, sorry, from the late Yuan, from a time when you wouldn't think that that regime had the sort of capacity to kind of envision, much less implement something like that. But basically one of the very late sort of last couple of decades of the Yuan kind of propositions for how to stay in power was to kind of propose and sort of take early steps towards implementing um, this kind of engineered and co-engineered system of the river and the canal. And so, at which then um, absolutely ended in disaster, but I mean, ended in Yellow River disaster and also in regime disaster and was something that the Ming then stepped back from for really a couple of centuries. And, um, you know, and I don't, I mean, it would be interesting to look into how Ming hydrologists and hydroengineers kind of thought back on the UN experience and how they interpreted it, um, which is a sort of a piece of the intellectual history of the river that I haven't done, but um, it's a really great suggestion. Fantastic. Okay, our next question is from our friend Chen Yuan from Yale University. Chen Yuan says, um, thank you for your wonderful and informative talk. I would say your book is a timely publication as it has a tremendous com contemporary significance. This year, the Yellow River floods again hit various provinces in China. Many blame the tragedies on climate change, but some think these are largely human disasters. So what do you think from a historical perspective? What do you think modern policymakers, that's very important, can learn from your book? Right, and thank you for a great question. And I know I said a few minutes ago that the ironic problem of the Yellow River today is not even always reaching the sea. And of course I was not thinking in it, about the, the tragic um, loss of lives and the floods this past summer, especially around Zhengzhou. So um, thank you so much for that question and for reminding me that that is the sort of the most recent story of the Yellow River is once again, a story of catastrophic flooding. And, um, you know, all natural disasters, right? As I, right, there's no such thing as a natural disaster at some level. This is one of the things I tell my students also, right? Disasters are always what people say are disasters. And so one of the things that we can expect in the time of contemporary climate change is that they're going to be um, larger, unpredictable storms. This is definitely something that people engineer around. Um, and one of the things, and I'm, I'm starting to sort of look for examples of this around the world. I, I just read a, a remarkable ar article about Holland where one of the responses to sea level rise kind of counterintuitively, ironically, isn't to build more pumps and more levees and more drainage, but exactly the opposite, to identify places that can't be protected by engineering or that can't be predictably always fixed by larger amounts of human intervention and instead where those are being restored to wetlands and are becoming regions where water will be allowed and encouraged to pool when water is high, recreating ecosystems for birds and marshlands and right, migratory birds. 
And um, this is also starting to happen in California, taking down dams, rebuilding wetlands, unbuilding levees. And, um, you know, in terms of, I mean, the way that I interpret the Ming and Qing history that I just briefly summarized that I talk about in my book, you know, where the Ming approach was, okay, let's have transportation that's a little slower, a little more inefficient, a little more expensive, but maintain a bunch of this hydrology in the form of wetlands versus the Qing case, which really worked for over a century, but was very, very expensive and always risked the most catastrophic of disasters, which ultimately occurred, which was to try to out-engineer nature. And um, if I could get the ear of a policymaker today, either on the Yellow River or really any of the world's great rivers, I would say, let's give more of this watershed back to nature. Let's give more of the floodplain back to nature. Um, It's going to ultimately be better for people as well as the other living beings with whom we share this planet, if we can make our human activity um, a little bit more inefficient, expensive, and do it in um, fewer areas. Thank you for your wonderful uh, answer. And I wanted to um, bring up one person, actually, Ding Xiangli, who is here in the audience at your talk. Um, Xiangli is writing his book, which is a related, a part of his book is related to wetland con- conservancy and uh, uh, conservation and uh, restoration, uh, specifically related to Yellow River. So whoever's interested in um, this issue, you should check out Xiang Li's work. So Xiang Li is a teaching at uh, Rhode Island um, School for Design. So check out his work. Let's move on to the next question. We still have as many very uh, wonderful questions. I want us to, to cover them. So the next one is by, it's from Yong Chen Tong. Um, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I, are, are there differences in the nature of the data? Um, from different dynasties. Did you see any difference between the Qing and the previous dynasties in terms of uh, collecting data and recording events about Yellow River? Yeah, um, right. And, you know, this takes me back to Ling's first question, which is, um, you know, what are the difficulties that, have I, that I've encountered? What are the things I'm sort of nervous about and, and concerned about in my work? And absolutely, one of them is data quality and the concern that um, I'm sort of, you know, bringing um, just kind of artifacts of data into my historical analysis. And the place where I know 100% that that's the case is in the difference between the data in the the, um, Northern Song and the Jin. And and basically even the place where that's most clear is the Yuan prior to reunification of the North and the South and the UN after reunification of the North and the South. And and basically the data collection just disappears when people are not on the floodplain that is, right? The recording of disasters and management events just disappears when the North and the South are separated from one another, Um, right? Because um, essentially, I mean, as I've been stressing, the history of of the Yellow River floodplain at least in later imperial times, is really a history of canal transportation. So when there isn't canal transportation between North and South, the quality of the data collection is also lower. Um, But, um, you know, in general, I mean, for for various reasons, I think that the, uh, and of course, for the earlier time period, the sort of the first millennium of history, the fact that there isn't much attested history of of management events and disaster events, um, I think is at least partially a an artifact of the data, but I think not entirely, not mostly, I would even say, partly because um, the, you know, within one regime, right, when things change mid-regime as they did during the Tang, for instance, that is captured in the way that people talk about history. And also because sort of long kind of um, synthetic and multi-century historical works like the Shui Jingzhu, right, from the, when is it, I think from the fifth, sixth century, right, which sort of, um, you know, is, is a whole book about waterways 
doesn't talk about the Yellow River as being a place of disaster, um, you know, a place full of sediment, a place where there is a lot of engineering and so on. So, um, so in general, I mean, they're absolutely artifacts of data, ways that data collection changed over time, but I'm fairly inclined with a couple of exceptions to think that that reflects real changes in the way people were relating to the river and not just changes in how record keeping was happening. Okay, now um, there is one question, actually a set of a question from someone I really would like to uh, like us to get to. Um, this is a scholar whose work I've been following. So this is from Michael Storazum at uh, Newcastle University Geoarchaeological Research, which I've been relying on for quite a few years. So uh, Michael says here, I've been doing geoarchaeological research on some of these historical Yellow River floods. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in learning more about your database. Again, database. I'm curious to learn about how you have a cross-reference these geocoded flood events in your database with the published archaeological reports, sediment, sedimentary outcrops, and cores that have been radiocarbon dated. Is there much a co a correspondence between the sedimentary record and the historical record? Great, and thank you so much for this question. And Michael, you're one of the people I have learned so much from also in the course of, uh, of my research. So it's so good to see you out there. Um, so the answer, the quick answer to your question is that I have not done that. Um, I have, you know, the, the reports of sedimentary cores that I have are relatively small. So I've um, kind of, well, there's a really small one that's just maybe 50 cores that I have integrated into my database. Then there's the larger one that I showed the image of where I have the image, but not the data itself, which I would love to integrate and haven't yet. Um, you know, this uh, the, creating my data set just from the historical data was a huge, huge task. And I did it starting with these published books like the Yellow River Annals and, you know, a total of, um, you know, um, like 70 tables and lists in about 10 books. And um, all of those are based on the historical data. One of the things that is that I am really, really eager to do within the next year or so is to publicly expose my data. And um, I hope that it will be used by many people to do many other kinds of projects. And one of the things that I would love to do myself or to see somebody else do with it is exactly the work that you're asking about here. But I myself have not done it yet. And I would love to see how that um, changes some of my interpretations. Ruth, that would be an amazing contribution to mm -hmm. multiple scholarly fields. So please yes. do that. <laughs> Great. All right. So uh, we have a precious five minutes left, but we have uh, three questions to go through. So I'm just going to uh, let's keep the, your answer short, maybe. So first a question. So from TK True, uh, who actually um, sent over two questions, but we're just going to pick up one. How about the second? Would you please elaborate a bit on your very interesting remark on, quote, something is happening to the river because of something is happening hundreds of miles downstream. Um, oh, yes. I think when I said that, I think that was, and of course, I'm, I'm speaking extemporaneously here, but if I remember when I said that phrase, it was um, where I was sort of thinking about what people ex at the time who were experiencing these changes in the river were thinking about and um, whether or not um, historical actors were recognizing that there were increasing records rates of sedimentation and if so if they recognized where that sediment was coming from and very briefly what I'll say is um, going all the way back literally all the way back to the late warring states and the Han I have instances of historical writers who were 100 percent clear that the sediment on the floodplain on the Yellow River came from the Les Plateau and that human activity on the Les Plateau caused sediment to increase. The problem was sort of translating that 
into public policy. But the idea that people on the floodplain knew was happening on the Les Plateau is clear. Um, there are individuals going back to the Northern Song, prominent individuals whose careers took them back and forth between the Les Plateau and the floodplain who were aware that there was a relationship between these parts of the river. There are maps and texts about the entire Yellow River as a watershed going you know, back to the Warring States, back to the Han. So the idea that this was a complex ecological system is something that people were aware about and um, just didn't quite translate into public policy. Okay. Great, wonderful. Um, next question from Hui Ling Xu and um, says, hi Ruth, the fantastic talk, thank you. I have a question regarding the river management approaches. There were basically two kinds of approaches on Yellow River. One is a channel expansion, Bu Yu He Zhen Di, and the other is a channel contraction, Shu Shui Gong Sha. How do you look at the different consequences mm -hmm. caused by the adoption of the two approaches? Right, and this is something I think a few minutes ago, um, um, I think in, in response to Steve Harrell's question, right, I was, uh, I was talking about, you know, something that I sort of very roughly kind of caricatured as a sort of a Ming versus Qing approach, although these two approaches absolutely go much, much, much further back in time than that. I think they're both attested as far back as the Han. Um, and so absolutely, right, this sort of river management is always kind of a sort of a push and pull between you constrict the river, speed up the current, um, cause the, the water of the current to scour out the sediment and therefore permit more human activity, but at the risk of more likelihood of disaster and uh, or more, more likelihood of catastrophic disaster and um, much higher expenses, or do you let the river spread out to some extent, at least to some extent, in which case you don't have to spend as much, the disasters are more frequent, frequent but le less catastrophic, but the amount of land and activity that humans can predictably turn to their own activity is therefore less. And um, basically the whole, you know, one way of thinking about the whole 2000 year history of the um, imperial policy disputation about the river is the push and pull, pull between these two approaches, each of which is, um, you know, legitimate, makes sense, um, has historical precedent, and just leads to very, very different kinds of policy making. Great. All right, Ruth. Um, I think if you don't mind, we will extend, you know, just for a couple of minutes in order to accommodate actually to look at this important question from our friend, Peter Perdue at Yale University. So Peter says, Ruth, uh, you said that following the shifting baseline theory, local people and officials on Yellow River had a short historical time frame. Some of us are looking at the Yangtze River have found that aesthetic values of the Yangtze lakes generated ideals of a beauty expressed in Tang times and promoted efforts to restore lakes in the Qing dynasty. Can you say something about the aesthetic uh, values of the river and the landscape in the north and its effects on river control? That is a really interesting question that I have not ever explicitly thought about. And, um, and I would love, you know, Yuan Chen or somebody, if there's an art historian out there, I would love to talk more about this. But my sense is that there's very, very little aesthetic writing about the Yellow River throughout its long history, right? Certainly compared with the rivers and waterways of the South. Um, and that even before the Yellow River was a problem, it was not ever a space of, that was sort of um, kind of aesthetically construed as a space of lyric beauty. It was not a place that people were writing poetry about or painting landscape paintings about. Um, to the extent that I can think about artwork 
associated with the Yellow River. It's like, you know, paintings of emperors going to visit the river to conduct the Feng and Shan sacrifices. That is, that it was always a place where the art and the poetry was deeply associated with hydrology and management and state power and not with the inherent beauty of the river. You know, it's associated, for instance, with the wetlands of the Shui Hu Chuan, right, which were, of course, about, you know, fears about places being beyond state control, being hard to manage, right, being outside the, the constraints of state power. And so this idea of a river that was ever just beautiful because it was beautiful or a landscape that was was a place of landscape beauty, I think. I would love to hear someone else communicate to me about this. If someone knows more about this, you know, please contact me. But I don't think the Yellow River was ever that kind of river where management decisions and policymaking had to take into account this sort of um, um, kind of uh, tradition of, you know, beauty and appreciation and um, kind of recreation. Hmm. This is actually a very interesting question. And I happen to look at the list of our participants, our attendants. One of our friends and a previous speaker for our series, an artist who's here, Michael Cherney, who's, uh, um, who lives in Beijing and who dies in to, to participate in this event in this early hour. So Michael, uh, Michael Cherney is a photographer uh, using photographic techniques to recreate and to and also create um, a, a, a traditional Chinese landscape painting style uh, photography. So um, he recently has um, um, done several sets of work in relation to Yellow River. Of course, it's about 21st century Yellow River. So I feel like maybe there's a conversation that we can um, do again with Michael to in order to dig into the historical time period, this particular aspect. So for, for whoever interested in this, check out Michael Cherney at Google uh, artist uh, residing in Beijing. So uh, with this note, we will have to conclude our event. So Ruth, I feel sorry that I have to rush you again and again today, but this is really because your talk and your book have generated so much enthusiasm. We've gotten so many wonderful questions and I we still have several questions we were unable to cover. So whoever's interested in Professor Ruth Marston's research and her new book, uh, reach out to her. Uh, Professor Marston at the University of Pittsburgh and found out her emails and shoot her a message. I believe in her big busy schedule, she will find the time to connect with you. So um, let me remind you quickly on November 5th, we will host a talk with a professor in Jiatan at Wesleyan University to talk about energy history, modern China, electricity. For those China scholars here, if you notice the past three weeks, China has been experiencing tremendous across nation electricity shortage and the, which has created so much panic in China right now. That means you should come back to listen to Professor Tan's talk on energy history. So let me thank Ruth for producing such amazing book and for offering us a wonderful glimpse into this book. Um, it's such a tremendous achievement. Congratulations and thank you for sharing you. it with us. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And thank you all for coming. So, great. So great. wonderful to see you all and Ruth, take care. We great. will be in touch. Good. Bye-bye.